Hello everyone, happy 2021. Um, I thought I would start out um, for the first IG Live of the year. I thought I would talk a little bit about um, color trends to start off the year and um, what's coming up both in fabric more specifically, but also interiors in general because everything obviously always works together and you're kind of seeing different versions of the same um, kind of trend um, as well between fabric and, and interiors. Um, and I also thought I'd talk a little bit about this sort of forecasting that's done in the design world around color just in general, um, kind of what's become the norm. So I'm an avid follower of the various like color of the year um, proclamations from brands like the paint companies who do it. Um, the ones I follow kind of the most particularly are Sherwin-Williams and Benjamin Moore. Those are kind of the two, two bigger arbiters to me. Um, and of course, Pantone's color of the year, which is the big, kind of the big statement. And I wanted to speak my thoughts a little bit, my take on kind of Pantone and their predictions. Um, Pantone in particular, it is a hot topic here in the studio. Um, I work out of the studio with Nikita, who runs our social media for Maxwell and uh, communications. And we chat a lot about this. We chat a lot about Pantone. Um, we talk about the change kind of in scope and the change in relevancy over the years of Pantone's color of the year, of their predictions. Um, really what was once kind of a true, what I would consider like a true trend forecast that was specific to the design industry. Um, that was kind of the original scope. Um, and I think it's really moved beyond that, um, which we see even more with 2021. So kind of the original intent behind Pantone Color of the Year was very much spanning across different kind of streams within the design industry. So all the way from package design, um, and when I'm talking package design, it's, I mean, if you buy a new face cream, if you buy a new wine, or like the new, you know, um, nude soda or whatever you're buying, it's kind of, trends informed from the, that kind of packaging, all the way from package design through to fashion. So that is um, haute couture, that is ready to wear, that is um, mass market fast fashion, all the way through that sector into obviously interiors, um, basically all the way through. So looking at kind of your ff &E, your furniture fixtures and equipment, that kind of, um, Pantone prediction was speaking to kind of all of those. Um, so the original prediction really was more the design industry as a whole. And what we're seeing now, I would say, really picked up in the last kind of couple of years, but probably the last 10 years in general. Um, their color announcements now these days are, they're calling it kind of the defining color of the year. And that is in a much more macro, um, zoomed out kind of way, um, it's very encompassing. We're talking about like socioeconomic situation. Um, we're talking about big worldwide events like if the Olympics is on or if it's the World Cup in soccer, um, the state of the environment. That is a very macro viewpoint for kind of a trend color. So for that reason, I sort of have to reconsider the relevancy of it to the specific design industry. And that's why I'm always going to look more towards like your Benjamin Moore and your Sherwin Williams and some more kind of more micro and more targeted kind of color trend forecasting. Um, even in this day and age of social media, you can zoom in a little bit more on the social media platforms and be looking at particular, say, bloggers or influencers within each sphere that you're particularly looking at. Because a single person, um, and especially a couple people together, if they're kind of on the same vein and it's within that small zeitgeist, you're seeing a lot of influence there. Um, so I definitely, I always enjoy looking at the Pantone prediction um, and kind of enjoy <laughs> critiquing it from that standpoint of the fact that it has changed over the years. Um, Nikita and I were chatting and saying probably the last time that we saw it had this really applicable kind of relevance where I really did see a reflection of that color in the design industry would be um, 2012, which was Tangerine Tango. And you really did see so much orange kind of permeating all different kind of layers of design. And that informed the next couple of years. Um, of course, the thing is too, when we're talking about color trends today, just because it's a new year doesn't mean everything turns on a dime and all of a sudden we go from craving, you know, a warm neutral to we pivot on a dime and it's 
a completely wild other color that everybody has to have. These are, these are larger kind of impactful purchases when you're looking at the uh, design sphere. This isn't buying just a new top. This is maybe having, um, you know, a custom velvet sofa made and there's a lot of consideration kind of that goes behind that and obviously a massive amount of personal taste as there should and the designer's own aesthetic taste when they're working with um, their their client and, and then the client's ultimate taste as well. But when I'm talking kind of color trends, these are sort of where we're seeing general directions. You can take it in a more kind of general sense. So I talk a lot about undertone because it is very important when you see undertone shifts within trending colors. Blue is, blue is a classic. Blue is not a hot or trending color. It is simply a standby, a classic. It is an enduring color. But where you can kind of note the shifts is you can watch those undertones and the level of saturation um, change. And that can kind of give you a little bit of a sense as to some other trends and where you'll see stuff going as well, kind of if that, um, if that makes any sense. So the colors I'm gonna show you, I decided to do this as uh, paint swatches because I'm talking to my phone in the studio and I think it's gonna be easier for me to hold up um, a paint swatch for you um, so you can actually read it on a, a flat level because if I'm showing you fabrics, sometimes when we're talking like nuance and undertone and shade, um, if I'm showing you a fabric with a little bit of a nap or a pile, it's gonna read a little different on camera. So I'm gonna show you some paint swatches. Um, I pilfered a whole bunch from the Sherwin-Williams store actually um, to show you guys today. So some of these colors are definitely already out there. They are maybe already trending upwards. Um, and then some of them are perhaps we'll say a little bit more aspirational. They're not such kind of highly usable colors that I'm saying you're gonna see this absolutely everywhere. What you're gonna see with some of these is kind of small doses and accents and just kind of a general shift to maybe to some of these shades. Um, your neutrals are never gonna go away, but like I said, the undertones of those neutrals are gonna shift and change, which is also really fascinating to me. I, I actually like to see those subtle changes um, over years rather than necessarily the wild it color that kind of comes out um, and is absolutely everywhere because I do think those can be a bit more of a flash in the pan and I like to see where undertones in general go. Um, it's why I love looking through um, Interior design books and kind of coffee table style books from like the 50s, 60s, 70s, you can see how our appreciation of color, our relationship with color in interiors, in different items, how it's changed over the years. Um, you look at even just appliance color shifting over the years. Um, it's a really interesting kind of history um, of our relationship to our interiors and to our things. Um, so I thought I would use the one of the Pantone color colors of the year um, as a jumping off point. As we know, as I'm sure you know, it is um, the yellow is that they kind of put forth is quite a bright, like rubber ducky kind of uh, shade of yellow. It's, it's very intense. It's quite um, primary. Yellow is really important, and I think we're going to see it grow in importance as we all spend more, times in our, more time in our homes and see the need for warmth and kind of a stepping away from white on white on white. Um, but I will say, I think it's going to be a different set saturation level. I don't think we're going to see all of a sudden this wholesale adoption of this incredibly saturated um, kind of colder yellow. So what I'm showing you, we're arranging... Oh, it actually reads okay on camera. So this is kind of like the buttercream end of the spectrum that I'm seeing. You can see these are really subtle changes. It's that soft buttercream kind of almost chiffon kind of shade. And I, oh, what I love about this too is it pairs really well with a cooler, more stark kind of white. It pairs well with a cooler neutral. So we've got all the way from this kind of pale shade there is definitely a little bit of warming that you can kind of see. It's a little tricky to see, but this is about two shades, almost two shades different than this one here. All the way from that to a slightly more green inflected yellow. This is Sherwin-Williams Pale Moss. And then where it does move to a warmer, this actually reads significantly brighter on my phone, I believe, than it really is in, in real life. I would say this is a much more tinted, uh, and by tinted meaning having white added, a more tinted version of um, Pantone's shade. So it's way less saturated, it's way less intense. Um, 
yeah, it is reading a little bit harsher on camera, but much softer and, and kind of more easy to layer in. So there's kind of that whole um, spectrum of yellow all the way from your pale, pale chalk kind of shade um, with just a, a, a hint of yellow to it through buttercream and then warming up into your more saturated but still tinted versions almost to like a canary uh, kind of yellow. So then if we're looking at the other Pantone color of the year too, looking at the gray that they put forth, um, it's quite a cold and, and in my opinion a bit of a flat gray and it's actually kind of the opposite of what we've slowly been moving towards, um, at least in terms of interiors, where we're starting to see so much more brown undertone, brown and green, particularly undertone coming into these neutrals. So. I'm going to show you first, actually, because it is also a gray. Um, this is Sherwin-Williams color of the year. This is Urbane Bronze, which is really more of a gray. It's just a beautiful, warm gray um, with quite a bit of, of depth to it. And you'll see, when you kind of see some of the other colors that are rising in trend, this pairs so well with it as a neutral instead of something that's colder and flatter, which is going to look a lot more harsh against some of the shades that we're using it with. Like this is such a more soft um, and sophisticated kind of combination if you are going to pair the two. Um, so that is the Urbane Bronze. I would say even more than Urbane Bronze, I'm seeing even more of a, um, more of a brown influence in your gray. So this is um, called Suitable Brown. And this has a little bit more of that green undertone and that brown warmth to it, which is just extremely usable. And you'll see how usable it is too with some of the other colors um, kind of coming up here. This is another bronze shade from Sherwin-Williams. This is Status Bronze. And this is even more usable to me than the Urbane Bronze or more kind of where the trend is, is headed a little bit with that kind of green undertone and that warmth, which makes it so usable. Um, I find it particularly interesting to see how much these particular shades, if you're looking at kitchen design, um, are being used in cabinetry um, to really move away from that all white on white kitchen um, and using these rich neutrals with such a complex undertone and such a complex um, depth to the color um, to sort of mix things up in a kitchen and kind of move away from that kind of stark shade. You can kind of see it coming in, I think, almost soonest, or that's where you saw it first was um, moving in from kind of kitchen design as well. And, and then you see that um, going into textiles as well, for sure. You see that in a lot of the wool and um, cotton and plush kind of mohair, faux mohair looks that are trending. You see a lot of this like interesting rich depth um, going through there. So that's kind of our, our gray family. Um, and then that leads kind of naturally with a brown undertone, that leads into these sort of trending browns right now, which again, this one is very green and flected. And, and on camera, it's actually reading as more of a green than it is a brown, but it is a really uh, kind of rich British tan shade. And you can see, sorry, you can see the, the deeper version of it there. So kind of going from these browns to your yellow take on it, which is still even more muted kind of than an ochre. So you're really looking at umber, burnt umber, um, sienna and burnt sienna shades. Here as well. So the browns are really going to like a, a Kalamata kind of um, rich brown, which you can kind of see Oops, even uh, here as well. And then moving from the brown into the um, clay shades, which have been really gaining in importance over the last couple of years. And they, they remain important and are just, just being tinted and shaded just a little bit differently. This kind of verges onto almost a, a sort of persimmon, kind of baked persimmon shade. Also really, really usable. And you can layer that so well with some of the other uh, shades and colorways. And then moving into kind of more of a butterscotch, a butterscotch kind of take. So you're seeing Kalamata, peanut, persimmon um, kind of takes from brown through to clay, um, leading you into a different kind of take on pink. 
I don't really know how else to classify this other than a take on pink. This kind of looks like we're just shifting from the clay color, but it really, really is, um, they're calling it rojo dust. So it does have that rose, that rosewood kind of tone to it. And that's such a usable way. And, and different, tint, different tints and kind of versions of this. So this is your slightly more saturated but still tinted version. And then you can take it all the way to the neutral, um, which almost breeds like a beige, but is, is a really soft tinted version of your Rojo. It kind of has a calamine sort of feeling to it, which is very sophisticated and quite, quite neutral, a very neutral way to do pink. And you can see that influence of essentially kind of the, the base color, believe it or not, is actually kind of this cerise. So you're taking kind of a cerise shade and tinting it or shading it one way or another, and it's kind of shifting all off of this really gorgeous cerise shade, which is such a cool starting point and quite, quite glamorous. And you can see if you were to take that, tint it and soften it out a little bit, then you can see that it turns into this slightly more muted kind of usable shade. And then you take it all the way down in saturation, you can see that these kind of share that same undertone. And in fact, this Moroccan brown is reading a little bit more brown on camera than it is, a bit more pinky, a um, bit more pink in real life. So that's kind of where we're going with the kind of cerise calamine with the brown and slightly bluish undertones. And you can see those blue undertones here this looks very pale and wispy on camera, but it does have kind of a, a brightness to it and is just a super, super tinted version, a cooled down kind of cerise. And then the other accent color would be in this kind of lilac sort of family that is also kind of coming out, used in small doses. But if we move to the blue family, um, we saw that Benjamin Moore's color of the year was a G in teal, um, which kind of made me laugh because I remember when a G in blue was like a color of Honda. <laughs> um, but it is a really beautiful color. It is a very safe um, and usable choice. It's essentially a version of spa blue. Um, and it is important to remember too that the Benjamin Moore is a paint, paint company, so they are predicting specifically um, for paint colors for wall colors, which sometimes will be kind of the softer um, or slightly more tinted or muted kind of version um, of a shade. But it's, I think it's the takeaway there is the green undertone, the importance of the um, green undertone and that presence. So I have one of the shades here, which has been so popular in textiles and will continue to be. Um, Sherwin Williams call this Moscow Midnight. It has, um, it's quite, quite dark. And then it has that green inflection as well, it's a really beautiful blue. And then a slightly more red-based version of that, more indigo as well. And then I think when I'm gonna show this on camera, it's gonna look more like it's just an off black, but it is an, an extremely, extremely dark blue. And that's another huge trend, um, is this use of real subtlety in your, not just your light neutrals, but when you're going to these very, very dark colors, which are so popular, seeing real subtlety in the use of undertone and the importance of undertone. Um, and we're seeing so many green undertones across different, different colorways. We're seeing um, green playing an important role in the undertone. So that leads me into my last color, which is the importance of just green as a color across the board. It's definitely present in a lot of shades as an undertone, particularly in neutrals but then green unto itself as well. Um, it's probably, in my opinion, going to be one of the, kind of the dominating um, colors in interior and just design spaces. All the way from this kind of lightest shade, which is like a fava bean um, green, this very light, soft shade, even tinted even more than this, um, even a little bit lighter, all the way through this olive shade, kind of saguaro olive shade, which has been definitely trending um, for a while and is not going anywhere. And then I love this, uh, I think this colorway is, that's palm leaf, this is Relentless Olive, which I love that color name. So this is your even kind of more usable, kind of muted out shade, which is just very usable pairing it back to 
kind of any of the shades I was showing previously. It does pair back together really well if you're looking at it kind of with the pinky beige. It's like a very sophisticated combination. So all the way through kind of the gamut of greens, and you see this so much in kitchen design right now, these incredibly deep saturated shades. And this is, this is obviously not a brand new trend, but it's really going strong, especially as we are spending so much time in our homes, in our spaces, and introducing um, more plants, more greenery, um, more natural and botanical kind of elements, then this is kind of a natural fit, especially with some of these rich, warm, kind of neutral gray browns as well. So that kind of fits together. So that's sort of my inspiration and kind of take coming into 2021 and kind of doing um, a look at the colors. I'm putting the finishing touches over the next four weeks on collections that will be coming out um, in the early fall, kind of like a pre-fall uh, August collection. So I'm really kind of dialing into colors here in the studio and, and making sure um, we're moving in kind of that direction, which is really important when it comes to neutrals in particular, making sure you've got um, elements that are going to work with the other accents that designers are going to want to use um, in spaces that, that people are going to want to put together. It's especially crucial with neutrals to have that right undertone. Um, and obviously you can't be 100% trend based. You do have to have, you know, a little, a little bit of everything um, for everyone, but kind of shifting a main focus. Um, I'm really fascinated to kind of starting off the year starting in December and then into January, looking at all of these kind of trend roundup pieces that inevitably come out in December and January, um, looking at the predictions. Um, I'm always very fascinated by where they come from and how that is changing and how it's particularly changed in like around the last five years um, where we're all on social media and the algorithms that are showing us um, showing us the, the media that we're consuming, the algorithms become more and more tailored by their very nature to our interests and what we're, what we're into, almost to the point of an echo chamber sometimes. So I do love to kind of actually try to break out of that and go a little further afield um, and, and get something that's gonna like shake me up a little bit and maybe startle me in terms of whether it's color, whether it's material, and you have to reach outside of your own um, kind of stream of design sometimes to do that. And that's why art history is such a huge um, influence and such a big space of interest for me because it shakes you out and it, it sort of um, can inspire you in a, in a really sometimes maybe negative way. You, you see something that's like so ugly, but it's a good, it's a good kind of ugly. It's something that you really need to, yeah, refresh your eyes almost. It's like uh, when you smell uh, coffee beans when you're trying perfumes on. You need a palate cleanser to kind of um, have you reassess things with new eyes. So I am very interested in seeing where trends come from. I love to identify a micro trend and kind of see how it'll proliferate across different, you know, my social channels. Um, so it's just something to keep an eye on is sort of where trends come from and the influence sometimes that one or two people can have um, when we're in these very um, kind of bubbles of um, influence when it comes to social media and, and design and trend and then seeing the trends that go way beyond that that transcend that completely um, and and kind of become more of a kind of global thing become kind of truly in the popular zeitgeist that's always really fascinating to me so um, I'm sure I will check in again with some more colors as kind of things change um, and I hope that was interesting and I hope you guys have a great week thanks for joining me